know you're not alone Cause I'm gonna make this place your What up, YA family? How y'all doing? Yes, you guys are a lovely bunch. Uh, my favorite Starburst color and flavor has got to be cherry, guys. Any cherry people out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, if this is your first time, my name is Kelly. I am the young adult pastor here at the Church of Rocky Peak, and I'm stoked you're here. We meet every Sunday night at 7.30 here in the Ridge on Sunday nights, and we're so glad you're here. And in fact, if you're sitting next to somebody, just look at them right now. Everybody look at them and just be like, hey, and turn to the other person and say, how are you? But don't answer the question because it's my turn to talk. Great, great. So we are on part two of our series uh, called, you know, uh, Welcome Home, Starting the Conversation with God, right? We're talking about prayer. And in this series, we say home is not where the heart is because it's easy for our heart to lead us astray. But instead, home is where the Father is. That's right. And God is calling us to draw us near and close to him like our worship songs do lead us to pray. And speaking of prayer, how do, <laughs> has it ever dawned on you that you don't know how to pray? Like, it's weird. Because of some of the things that we do, it may not be the things that we read in the Bible. And, and, and perhaps you've never thought to maybe ask somebody to pray. Like, or not to pray. You probably ask someone to pray other than yourself. You, how do I pray? You never ask the question to someone, hey, can you teach me how to pray? You probably never ask that question. And it would be completely rude if somebody, after you prayed on Thanksgiving morning or afternoon or evening, I don't know when you guys do your Thanksgiving. Don't bother me. All right. So it would be rude if you prayed during Thanksgiving dinner and someone said, uh -uh, um, excuse me, excuse me, uh, you, you did it wrong. You did it all wrong because, you know, you were supposed to hold hands and you were supposed to, you know, uh, make everybody, you know, you're supposed to squeeze my hand at, at amen. And you didn't do that. Like that was just like, like you just, you just prayed all wrong, right? It would be weird if someone said that. But for some reason, we, we grew up thinking that prayer is simply talking to God. And maybe perhaps that's not completely what prayer is. Maybe prayer is something more than that. And maybe you were led to believe that prayer is a laundry list that we give to our cosmological grocery store called God. And we say, heal me for this, give me that, and make sure I don't flunk this. And whenever something bad happens, you go to the cosmic grocery store in the sky and say, God, please get me out of this. Has anybody ever prayed like that? Don't raise your hand. And maybe, maybe you thought prayer was that for your whole life. And maybe you're watching on YouTube or you're here in the audience and you're thinking, why should I even pray? Because I, it doesn't seem like God is really answering. Because something tragic might have happened and you prayed. You prayed. You, you thought you were praying. And nothing really changed. So you gave up on prayer altogether. And you're like, why bother with prayer? And if that's you, and if you've ever thought that, let me tell you that tonight you are closer to a breakthrough than you've ever been before. That tonight is a night where you're going to learn something a whole lot different than maybe what you grew up believing. And I'm going to attempt to share with you the ultimate teacher's guide on how to pray. Because Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6 what it means to actually pray. Because what we see here is we see his disciples considering the reality that maybe they don't know how to pray. Because whatever they grew up doing, they saw what Jesus was doing and they're like, I, I, pff, I don't know what he's doing, but I want to do that. Because whatever Jesus is doing is different than what I grew up believing and doing my whole life. So would you join me? As I pray and attempt to bring to you what I believe Jesus has to offer us as we turn to Matthew 6. Father, in heaven, you're holy and we are thirsty. 
We are thirsty to hear your voice and to learn from you. So I ask, Father, that you would use me as a vessel to help illuminate your word. And we know that your word never returns void. So I ask that your will would be done in Matthew 6 right now as people's hearts and eyes turn to this passage, that it would penetrate their hearts and move them to action. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. Amen. Matthew 6, 5. So this is the context, is that last week we talked about it. So if you didn't get a chance to, you know, be here last week, go ahead and check it out. Um, Last week's message, and we're going to pick up where we left off. But just in case you missed a little bit, here's, here's the reality. Jesus is out there praying, and, and his disciples catch him praying. And, and they are so moved by whatever Jesus is doing that they, they, they risk sounding dumb or stupid by asking a question that seems, I don't know, like, like, a, like an infant question to ask, like a baby's question to ask, like a neophyte question to ask. And they say, um, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And then Jesus, instead, instead of teaching them how to preach, instead of teaching them how to serve, he teaches them how to pray. It's so wonderful in this passage. And he starts by saying what not to do. What not to do. And the first thing we we read is he says, don't pray like the hypocrites. See, verse 5 says, And when you pray, assuming that you do this, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and standing on street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Wow, there's a reward. Cool. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and your father who is unseen sees what is done in secret. Your father who is unseen sees what is done in secret. If that was prayer, if that was it, if that was all Jesus said, I think that would be enough. The fact that the God of the universe sees what you do when no one else sees you, that God, King, Lord, Master, sees you, notices you out of the six billion people on earth, sees you when you are alone, in secret, when you want to be in his presence. If that was all prayer was, that would definitely still be enough. But Jesus continues and goes further. And when you pray, do not keep babbling, babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. I've been there. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Wait a minute. If my father knows what I need before I ask, then what's the point in praying? Right? The answer to that question points to the motive. It points to your motive for prayer. Are you praying just to get like, you know, some like vending machine? You're just going to deposit some faith and hopefully get something back in return? Like, because if so, God already knows what you need before you need it. So prayer must be something more than just getting what we want. Now, verse 6 or verse 9, Jesus starts to tell us what we should do instead. Instead, he doesn't say that. I'm the one who said that. This is then how you should pray. Right? We don't really talk. This is then how you should pray. He just says, this is what you should do. And here's the thing. Jesus is giving us a model. He's not telling us what to pray. He's telling us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive those who are indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus models prayer. So here's the model. Are you ready? Here's the model. It doesn't start with requests. It doesn't start with our laundry list. It doesn't start with us treating Jesus or treating God like a Santa Claus with our wish list. It starts with recognizing who we're talking to. Right? We remember that from last week? Recognizing who we're talking to. We're talking to our Father. Our Father, which makes us his child. Right? God, Jesus could have chose, chose any other word 
than father. He could have chose king. He could have chose master. He could have chose Lord. But instead, he chose an identity statement for you to understand that you are his child and God is your father and you have access to the throne room, not because you're his servant, not because you're his slave, but because you are his child. Our father in heaven, holy is your name. Hallowed is your name. Now, once we we recognize him, right? He's hallowed, right? He's the, the, the highest place in our life. We, this is all from last week's, right? He, he, is, he holds the most esteemed place in our life. Then we ask, then we say, your will be done. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. So once we recognize who we're talking to, then we realign our hearts with his. So we recognize and then we realign our hearts with, with his. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here we are today in verse 11. This is the part we were all looking forward to. Verse 11 starts off with what? Give us. Give us. This is our favorite part. Give me. Yes. I get to finally ask the question. Because we, you know, you know what it is like, you know, to butter up like a parent or butter up somebody right before you ask them to do something. You're like, oh, hey, Dave, how you doing? You, you know, you are looking really slim today. Uh, you, that shirt really fits you well. Can I, can I borrow $20? I mean, that would be awesome if you can borrow, if I can borrow $20. Is that cool? Right. So, I, you know, so, so it's, it's funny how that works in real life sometimes. But we don't give Grant God the courtesy. We just go in straight for the kill. Like, give me $20. Give me a new job. Get me that woman. Get me that guy. Like, we just go in for the kill. But now, after we realign, recognize, now we can make a request. But have you ever thought about the things we can ask that God will always say yes to? Have you ever thought about the things that you can ask that God would always say yes to? Well, maybe tonight you will. Jesus asked three specific things that God will always say yes to, and perhaps this would change the way you pray. Perhaps we would stop trying to bend God's arm to do our will, but we would let God bend our hearts to want what he wants. So the first thing Jesus asks us to request is to feed us. Feed us. Feed us. Give us our daily bread. Give us our daily bread, Jesus says. That's the first thing we request. Give us our daily bread. And and instantly when Jesus said, give us our daily bread, it was like the, it was like these Jewish men and, um, well, whoever was listening, there might have been women listening, but these Jewish men were instantly transported back in their mind into Exodus. When the Israelites were set free from Egypt. See, because in Egypt, when they were slaves, when the Israel, when, 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 the, when the Israeli culture, when the Hebrew nation was in Israel being subjugated under Egypt, they had consistent meals, right? They had consistent meals. They had consistent work slash slavery. They had consistent, you know, schedules, consistent uh, homes to live in. And they, they knew where they were going to go every day. They went to work and they went back and they had a meal and they went to sleep and they went to work and they went back and they had a meal and they had consistency. And there's security in consistency, isn't there? But God had a bigger plan and he rescued them from slavery. And now they're out in the wilderness and they don't know where their next meal is going to be and they don't know where they're going to live next. All they know is there's a cloud and wherever the cloud goes, we go. And we don't know how long that cloud's going to be there. And we don't know how much food we're going to have for the next day. And so God freed them. But in exchange, they, they didn't know what was next. They were in complete and under, utter dependence on God. And that's exactly where God wanted them to be. God wanted them to rely on him. But they got antsy. And they started requesting for, for bread, for food. Clearly, they were in the desert. They're hungry. So God provided manna from heaven. So God provided this, this bread from heaven that provided all the nutrients, everything they needed 
And if they try to create security on their own, guess what? If they tried to save that manna for the next day, you know what happened? It would rot. It would rot because God was giving them enough for that day so that they would learn how to rely on him. See, what they wanted most was food. And God gave them enough to rely on him. What do you want most in life? Maybe it's not food. Because you know you can go to the grocery store and store up all you want. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. God wants you to pray, give me my daily bread. Give us our daily bread. So what is it that you want most? And that's the very thing that God wants you to trust him with. What is it that you want most? And if that is whatever it is, that is the very thing that God wants you to trust him with. Because oftentimes we say, we, we sit here in church and we say, God, I want to give you my life, everything, everything. You, you can have it all. And I'll give you the drugs. I'll give you the sex. I'll give you the, the smoking this. And I'll give you, you know, uh, the staying out here or give you whatever. I, give, I just want it all. I just want a fresh start on life. And you give this whole pile to God, and, and God's like, okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Oh, what is that? All right. And he's just like, ugh, what's that? And, and buried deep down is this shiny thing. And he says, that's what I want. The very thing that you don't want to give up. That's the thing that you need to ask God to provide. See, for me... And maybe for you, too, it's relationally. Have you ever felt relationally lonely and all you wanted just was somebody to talk to, but you know the wrong person that you should be calling is that ex? You know that feeling. Because you know you can just go on social media anytime you're feeling lonely, and you can just scroll and scroll and search and lurk. But instead of doing that, the very thing that I want most, I'm going to choose to trust. What is it that you want most? Like my friend Rick Warren says, he's a good friend of mine, we're really close. Um, he says, God provides for our needs and not our greeds. God gives us our needs and not our greeds. Uh, another friend of mine, he's in uh, Proverbs chapter 30. His name is Agar. He's one of my favorite guys in the Bible. The most obscure person you probably ever thought of, his name is Agar. It's the first time you ever heard the word, hear the word stupid in the Bible, uh, but you have to read it in the NASB. He calls himself stupid. And a couple verses later, he says, God, grant me two things before I die. Don't give me too much, lest I forget you. Don't give me too little, lest I rob and defile the name of the Lord. He's praying for his daily bread. What is it that you want most that you need to trust God with? The second thing Jesus teaches us how to pray with, the first thing he says, he, you know what? It's okay to request. Request what God will always grant you, which is food. So feed us. He will provide. Trust him with what you want most. The second thing is, forgive us. Forgiveness is something God will grant you. You want to see answered prayer right now? Start asking for forgiveness. There's plenty there to forgive, I'm sure. Anyways, it's, it's a bad joke. Anyways, all right. Forgive us. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Wow, that's a hard one, isn't it? Someone say, ouch. ouch. Yeah. Forgive us our debts. Well, when I read this passage, I think, like, what exactly did we, do we owe God? What is the debt that we owe God? Like, at what point did I, like, you know, go to Quicken Loans, <laughs> take some money out, and now I have a debt, and I'll just pay it back later? Like, at what point? Do you ever think of yourself as somebody who has a debt towards God? You don't have to answer that. I, I already know the answer is yes. So what exactly did you do? Well, let me just tell you. Because if you don't get this part, you're not going to get the second part. Because you, whatever you did caused the death of somebody. And so you got to realize that your hands are filled with blood because somebody's child died for whatever you did. So let me just tell you what you did. At some point, you failed to honor God. At some point. Because God is your father, but he's also king. And whenever you are living in the king's kingdom, 
and you fail to give honor to the king, what happens? Off with his head. Right? Do you, do you get what I'm saying so far? See, uh, whenever there's a king in your presence, what are you supposed to do? You bow. You say, long live the king. Hail Caesar. Something like that, right? You give honor to the king. And the moment that you don't give honor to the king, you are worthy of what? Death. Now, what happens when you dishonor an eternal king? Eternal death. And the only person that can pay an eternal debt is an eternal being. So, God couldn't see eternity without you. So he provided a way to pay the debt that you owed. But it couldn't just be anybody. It needed to be an eternal being who is both God and man so that you can live and pray this prayer for eternity and experience eternity for that matter. See, there's a debt that you owed that was so great that not even someone had to die for you. Like, I, it's so un- impersonal for me to say someone. I'm just talking about someone's child had to die for that. Does that make sense? And it's not until you understand how great of a debt that you've been excused of that you can even pray the next part as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And this idea of forgiveness does not come easy unless you realize that you've been excused of high treason. So you, you, you can't start to... You can't even start to forgive or even understand forgiveness until you realize the the degree in which you've been forgiven. See, when somebody offends you, let me just talk about forgiveness real fast. When somebody offends you, it's like they walked into your house and dumped trash right all over everything. Just like, you know, because hurt people hurt people. So they just dump their hurt right on you. And now you have to deal with the pain of somebody else just Bam. Now you, and not even you're not dealing with somebody else's pain. Now you are in pain as a result of somebody else's garbage. That's what being offended is like. And when you hold on to bitterness, when you hold them in the bondage of bitterness, it's like taking their garbage and putting it in your own closet. And it's not going to be long. It's not going to be long until that stench of the past starts creeping into other rooms of your life. And so forgiveness happens when you release somebody of the responsibility of the pain that they caused you by taking out their trash out of your house and taking responsibility for it and just, this is my pain now and I am going to take it out of my house and I will excuse them and bless them, but I won't trust them, but I will definitely not hold this pain against them anymore. See, you can't get to this without understanding how much you've been forgiven. You just can't. So God, in his holiness, invites you into his presence. But first, we we have to recognize who he is. We realize, you know, well, sorry, we recognize who he is. We realign our hearts with his. And then we make these requests. The first, we ask that he feeds us. The second, we ask that he forgives us and we forgive others. And the third and final, we ask that he protects us. Protect us. It says here, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, and but deliver us from evil. See, see, this word temptation here can be translated two ways. The word is perosas. Someone say perosas. It's not Spanish. That's just how I translate it. Right? It's, it's Greek. See, it could be the word temptation or it can be the word tested. Right? And so the, 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 the translators know that there's the, the, these two words mean different things. See, temptation, I want you to understand, temptations are opportunities to sin. Testing are opportunities to go to the next level. Do you understand? Any, anybody used to be in school? You know how that works, right? You don't go from middle school to high school without a what? Test. Thank you. I know you guys are. All right. And, and when it comes to temptation, 
you know when you get too close to the fire and you feel the heat. And those are opportunities to get hurt. See, temptation and testing are different. See, God wants you to be tested. He definitely does. And when it comes to temptation, the Bible says God does not tempt, nor does he let, uh, let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God can't be tempted, nor does he tempt. So what's happening here? The reality of your life is that you are being tested like gold is tested because you are precious in his sight, red and yellow, black and white. <laughs> and, and this testing process is, is, is very similar to like how silver is tested. Because the way silver is actually tested is, if you, you know, any silversmith, blacksmith people out here? I didn't think so. There, um, I'll, I'll tell you how. I know Zach, probably. Um, so basically, you take this like big cauldron, like pot-like thing, right? You put the precious metal, it doesn't look precious, it looks like dirt, um, in the metal, and it has lots, or in the pot, and it has lots of impurities on it. And so the way you separate the impurities is what? You, you, you burn it, right? You, you, you turn, the, turn the stove on, right? And then you do like this whole like wishes thing, you know? You just like stir this pot around and the silversmith has to pay attention because you can't cook it too long and you, you, you definitely don't want to cook it too little because it, it would be impure silver. And so the, the silversmith is watching the precious metal. So the, the fire is going, the pressure is building, the, the, the impurities are rising. Can you see it in your, in your mind's eye? The fire is, is going, the pressure is building, the, the impurities are rising, and, and he's watching it, and he's seeing things melt, and you're feeling the pressure, or not you, not yet. Um, the metal is fe like experiencing this pressure, and, and the dirty parts of the metal is starting to separate because the precious metal is heavier than the dirt, so all the dirt is starting to push up. And so what the silversmith does is scrape, scrape, scrape and you hear the friction and you see the fire and you know the pressure is building and the and the dirt is rising and it's scraping and then the fire is building and the the pressure is building and the and the, and the separation of the dirt and the dross and the impurities are rising and he's scraping and this is somehow like our lives on earth and the fire is burning and the pressure is building and the and the impurities are being separated from our lives. And the silversmith is scraping and scraping. And the silversmith does not leave. The silversmith is looking for one thing. You know what the silversmith is looking for? He's looking for his reflection. He's looking for his reflection in the pressure, in the fire, in the impurities as, they're, as he's scraping them off. He's waiting for the, for the silver to be revealed, and it's not revealed until he can see himself. And I guarantee, I promise you, you may be going through the fire today. You might be going through relational turmoil. You may be dealing with confusion. But the father, the silversmith, is not leaving because he's watching closely because he's waiting for his reflection. And he will not leave you or let you be tempted beyond you can bear. So we can pray with confidence, God, God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Where do you need protection in your life? And most of you need protection in your thought life. See, it's what we think about our situation that really wrecks us. When we think we're lonely, when we're really not. When, we're think, when we think that we're by ourselves, when we think that we're in need, or when we think that our actions don't affect other people, when we think that everything will just be fine, when we think we're not in sin, that is the part we need protection from because that is where the battle is happening. happening. So, so we pray for protection. First, we pray that God would feed us. He would forgive us so that we can forgive others. And lastly, we pray for protection. Three questions I want you to consider is what do you hunger for? What do you hunger for the most in your life? And who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to let go of the bondage of bitterness? Whose garbage you need to take out? 
And where do you need protection? See, these are the prayers that get answered every single time. These are the prayers that get answered every single time. And it's not because, oh, please hear me out. These are the prayers that get answered every single time, not because they move God, but because they move you. So will you pray like this? What would happen if you started to pray like this every day? What would happen if you what would happen to your prayer life if you modeled it after the way Jesus prayed? What would happen if everybody in this room started to pray like this? What would happen if everybody at this church started to pray like this? What would happen if everyone in Simi Valley would pray like this? I believe we would be starting a movement. But the movement begins with you. So I'm going to invite the band to come on up. And together, when we come before the Father, will we start by recognizing who he is? Realizing and realigning our will to him? And then request. Request from the Father to feed us, forgive us, and protect us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Our Father, man, I can't get enough of that. That you adopted me. That I can call you Father. That you are unlike any earthly father because you're from heaven. Your name is holy, your name is holy not just by title, but in person. And you've invited me into your presence. And I accept that invitation. And I just have... I just come here with my heart, and I just say, Father, you can have it. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. And lead us. Lead us from this day forward. If you're here today, and you've never given your life to Jesus. And, you're, and you know that, that you want your will instead of God's will. And there's things that you are hungering for that, that, that you need to trust God in. You might be hungering for a relationship, maybe a school, Maybe for, you're hungering for your family to stay together. And I want to give you an opportunity to trust God in those moments. Will you trust him today? And may, as you trust him, may you feel protected by God's presence. That you would not lose heart. Instead, you would grow stronger and stronger. And I pray that the evil woman stay far from us today. Lord, we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen.